Today we're talking about vector execution, and as I said, uh, compilation and query compilation from last class and vector, vector, vectorization are sort of the two main methods we can apply in a modern database system to improve query performance. So I'm going to first start talk about what vector vectorization is, what, how, how we're actually going to use SIMD, and then the paper you guys were assigned to read was this sort of recipe book or guide from these, the guys at Columbia on how to take sort of classic uh, database algorithms to do various things we need inside our database system and implement them using SIMD. And I like it because, again, it, it covers like, you know, all the various things we'd actually need in a database system to, to, to run analytical queries. The spoiler would be is that, I'll just say up front, that none of it actually works uh, with some exception because they're going to make this big assumption uh, about their operating environment, which I'll cover when we get to that. And then we'll finish up talking about uh, project three topics. Okay? All right. So vectorization is the process or the, the method we're going to apply in our database system to take an algorithm that was originally implemented assuming scalar operations and where you're going to take you know, one piece of data and ap apply one change or modification or operation to it. And, the, and then we're going to convert that to now being able to take a vector of data items, whether they're tuple values, tuple pointers, uh, it, it depends on the algorithm. And then now we can invoke a SIMD instruction that is going to allow us to apply the same modification, apply the same operation on those vector of items within a single instruction. Right? And so we'll see this, though. It's not always going to be, uh, there, are, there is going to be some prep work where we have to put things into these special registers and, and then apply the vectorized instruction. So it's not like we, we magi magically can make anything in our code become vectorized. So again, the paper you guys were reading was about how to take very specialized, or take very specific algorithms or components of the data system and, and being able to run them in parallel. So it's sort of obvious why we'd want to do this, um, right? because now we can do uh, more work with fewer instructions. Uh, but one of the big advantages we're also going to get from this is that this is going to be independent of all the things we talked about before when we, when we talked about parallel query processing, because that was all about how to take a query or whatever you want to do in our database system and divide the work up across multiple threads. Now we're saying in this lecture here, how do we take a single thread and make what it's doing actually be run in parallel, right? And the, again, the speed up you can get potentially is massive because it's multiplicative, right? So say I have a, an algorithm that I can run on 32 cores or 32 threads, so I get a 32x speed up if I, do, if I, you know, if I paralyze that. But then now if I, I'm doing vectorization for what the work each thread is actually doing, and say I have a uh, four-lane SIMD register, Meaning, for a, a piece of work, I can run, I can operate on four data items in parallel with one CMD instruction. So now I'm going to get also 4x speed up there. So 32 times 4 is 128. So potentially, I could go from a single-threaded scalar implementation of an algorithm to something that I can run with 128x 120, speed up. Now, the problem is going to be, is, as, as I said to him earlier before class started, we're never actually ever going to achieve the, the, the maximum speed up. Like, this is our upper bound, and we'll see what, why when we go along. Again, as, as we have to prepare things, get in registers and out of registers, why we're never actually going to be able to achieve this. But, like, this is a good target. This is something that, that we definitely want to achieve or try to, to, to achieve. So, uh, who here has taken 618, 418? All right, a little, a little over half. All right, who here has never seen SIMD before? Okay, that's fine. All right, so SIMD is a, uh, it's a class of CPU instructions that the processor is going to provide for us that allows us, again, to do these vectorized operations. And we can contrast this with SISD, which is single instruction, single data, data item. SIMD is going to be single instruction, uh, uh, multiple data items together. And this, is sort of this, this notion of SIMD versus SISD comes from Flynn's taxonomy of parallel databases, or sorry, parallel systems from like the 1960s. Um, and so every instruction set for every CPU nowadays is going to have uh, in support for SIMD operations. It's just the name of what they're going to call the class of these extensions or instructions is going to be different. The paper you guys read was all about Intel stuff, and in their world, it's SSE or AVX. 
Um, and the paper you guys were reading, they were, it's 2015, I think, so they were dealing with AVX2, which is 256-bit registers. The state of the art now is 200 and, uh, sorry, 512 12 bits. Uh, Power from IBM has this thing called Altavec. ARM has this thing called Neon. And then a few years ago, they actually proposed something called SVE, the Scalable Vector Instructions. So what's actually really cool about this, and I don't know if anybody actually implements this yet, is the way they sort of set up the instructions is that they're not going to be specific to any register size, meaning they'll have a sort of, a, a sort of generic class of vectorized instructions. And then depending on how it's implemented in the actual CPU, you, you can then operate on like, you know, 1024 bits or 512 bits at a time, right? Where, where in all this Intel stuff, like AVX2 are instructions to do 256-bit uh, SIMD instructions. And then 512 is from 512 bit. And you can't just like, you, you can't just take these, run it on a newer CPU and think you're going to run on these ones. You have to rewrite your, your code to actually be aware that I'm running on uh, a larger, larger size registers. So let's look, look at a really simple example of uh, a SIMD operation. So say we have two vectors, x and y, and we just want to add together uh, the elements of x with the elements of y at, at each, each offset. So the way we would implement this uh, you know, in, in like an intro to CS class or intro database class is just we have a for loop where we know the size of the vector, assuming they're the same size. And then for every element x uh, and the corresponding element of y, we add them together and we write them into uh, to the output vector z. And so the way we would, this would get implemented or executed with SysD instructions is just, again, taking the for loop, ripping through and taking you know, one element from x, one element from y, invoking one instruction to do the, do the addition, and then writing it to a, a, our output buffer. Now with SIMD, what we can do is we're going to take a vector of elements from these two arrays and then combine them together in a single register, then invoke one SIMD instruction to add them together and, pr and produce our output buffer. Right, so we're going to take four elements here. So we would say this is a four-lane register. And assuming we have 32-bit integers, we'll say this is a 128-bit SIMD register. So once we populate this register, we then invoke the SIMD instruction on those two registers. And then it's going to write out some uh, output result to another SIMD register that's going to be the same size. Do the same thing for the next four elements, invoke the SIMD, uh, and now we produce our output. Yes? His question is, it, his question is, is loading into a SIMD register just as fast as loading into a, like a regular you know, single data item uh, register? It depends on where the data is located. Like if you're doing that selective store thing we talked about, that's definitely going to be slower. Because um, if it spans multiple cache lines, it, it, it's more work. I think, the way, I think the way x86 works is, you can only do one or two loads and stores per cycle. So if this thing's really wide, you may have to do multiple loads in, like, across multiple cycles, whereas like, writing one thing into the, to a, to a you know, single data, data, data register is super fast. And that's what I'm saying. You're, we're never going to achieve the theoretical maximum speed up just because there's, there's overhead of putting things in here. Right? But certainly in the case of this, you know, it, it, this would be a really good trade-off because we went from uh, eight instructions to do, it, to do the addition to, to two instructions. That probably is going to be a win for us. Yes? Um, if we go over 512 bits in our um, SIMD register size, then all of a sudden it's larger than a cache line. Does that mean then that we're always going to be spanning a cache line if we have larger than 512 bits in our register? So his question is, uh, if we go to 512-bit registers in AVX 512, that's going to hit our cache line limit. Does that mean now uh, the loads into it are going to be more expensive? Uh, and then certainly the stores getting the data out, would that end up being more expensive than this? Because, again, we have to spam multiple cache lines. Um, well, it doesn't matter if even at 512, and we're, if we're not ca perfectly cache aligned, you're always going to be spanning uh, multiple cache lines. If you're not, if you're, sorry, if you're not cache aligned, yeah, like, it depends on where this data is. Also, like, think of this as like, this is hanging out in L1. Okay. So L1 is in, in x86 is 32 kilobytes. So, so we could take all the data we want to store and keep that in L1. And then it's not like we're going out to memory to go get it. All right. All right. So what can we do with SIMD? Well, I showed uh, some basic arithmetic operators. And again, under, the, the, at least for x86, uh, for the SVE, I think they still have the same issue. Like, like the, register side, the, the size of the register will be, will be fixed, but like, it doesn't necessarily mean that the... Uh, 
the size of the lane has to be fixed. So in my example here, I had a 228 bits, and therefore I had a SIMD instruction that could take four integers and add them together. But if I had 16-bit integers, there might be another instruction they provide to know how to take eight 16-bit integers and add them together, right? So typically the way you, when, you, when you write SIMD code, you specify like, I know what, what, what the data type size is that I'm operating on. We talked about how to move data in and out, uh, and then there's all these logical instructions to do comparisons on you know, a bit manipulation. Uh, we can do comparison instructions, right? and we'll need this to do predicates to say you know, whether something equals something in our where clause. Shuffle instructions is the ability to take the output of, or take one SIMD register and write it into another SIMD register. Right? And this, this is going to be a big win for us because now we don't have to take the output, put it in L1, and then write it back out into another register. We can go directly from one register to the next. Uh, and then there's other random things, um, like we'll see in a second, like the, the take the data that's sitting in L1 and then convert it into the, the form that the SIMD register wants. Or if now we have something in our SIMD register, maybe we want to write it out to memory, but we don't want to pollute our CPU cache. So these, these, these streaming instructions allow us to take the, the output directly from the SIMD register and put it, put it right into memory without going through the normal caching hierarchy. All right? So the main idea of what we're going to try to achieve here is by having all these different instructions, uh, you know, we can try to do it as, as pack as much useful data we want into our SIMD instructions and do as much processing as we can on that data while that they're in our SIMD registers before we have to go shove it out into memory, right? And these, like, especially this, these, 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 these conversion, op or sorry, the, the shuffling operators, this is going to allow us to, to do this. We'll chain some operations together, never have to touch CPU cache, and then we, we, we can produce uh, the results that we want, right? This last one here is also super important, too, because, uh, especially for joins, like, if I know that um, I'm doing the join, the tuple matches, but there's a pipeline breaker above me, and I can't, I can't do anything with the output of the join, I can then shove it out to memory because I know I'm not going to need it again until I come back and go to the next pipeline. So this, these streaming uh, functions allow me, or streaming instructions allow me to like, use the data that's in the CMD register and then you know, put it out into memory before going back to it. All right? So we'll see after, this, after the spring break and after the, the project proposals uh, next class how we can, we can use some of these techniques and... Um, in our joint operations as well. Yes? Wait, this streaming idea sounds very nice. Is it available for non instructions? This question is, these, these streaming, instruction, streaming instructions sound very nice. Are they available for non uh, non operations? Yes, I think so. I, I, yes. I think if you, if you streaming writes, I think that's what they're called in, in x86. Um, yeah. OK. So again, we're going to focus on x86 because that's the dominant CPU architecture. And this is just showing you a history of, uh, over time, how the, the Intel has expanded for support for, uh, for, uh, you know, for, for, for SIMD. Um, the very beginning, it was called MMX. And this was like, it's like super primitive. Like, this is like, like, I think, Pentium 3 days or Pentium 2 days. And Intel had this big marketing pitch about how these, I think MMX actually didn't stand for anything. Like they can, Intel's afraid of getting sued, so like they just took three letters, put it together. I think now people think of these as like multimedia extensions. But at the time, I think there was a lawsuit where someone claimed that uh, M Intel stole their MMX name from some other company. But then they found all this internal documentation that showed that like, oh, it's, it's three random letters. It, it means nothing, right? So they lost that lawsuit. But at the very beginning, it was super primitive, right? It could only do uh, some basic operations on... 32 or 16-bit integers. And this early version as well, it would, it would be this, the, the CPU wouldn't be normally executing SISD instructions, but then when you executed the SIMD instructions, you had to pause the SISD stuff, do the SIMD, and then start back up the, the SISD. After that, after MMX, when SSE came out, then you can actually do these in parallel. Now, this is what I was saying before about how uh, with an out-of-order out uh, CPU architecture, we can have different parts of the CPU doing different things at the same time, right? So we could have executing some SIMD instructions on, on the SIMD registers while, while we do you know, stuff on regular CPU registers. Whereas the MMX, you couldn't do that. And in the modern era, it started when, it, when AVX came out. Um, I don't think there's any, I think this, this, this was just a naming change because they went from 128 bits to 256 bits. Um, and then instead of calling this AVX5, 
which would make sense when they call it AVX2 or AVX whatever, like they call it 512. And I've looked online, and as far as I can tell, they have no plans to put out uh, 1024 bits. So this is sort of the, the, where we're at right, right now. And this link here will take you to this awesome video from this guy, James Rendier, who was a, like a SIMD designer or evangelist at Intel. And he basically shows all the awesome things you, you can do with SIMD. Not, it's, it's, he's not a database person. It's just like it's showing you how to actually flex the hardware and get the best, uh, uh, you know, get, get, the, get the best bang for the buck. And I highly recommend this video. Like it's, it's, I think it's like an hour or so long. All right, so, uh, so there's going to be trade-offs, obviously, using SIMD. It seems like it's a magical thing that we're going to always want to use. Um, and of course, yes, in some cases, we will see we'll get a significant performance gains if we use them. But the tricky thing is going to be is actually implementing an algorithm to use vectorized instructions is, is, is not going to be trivial. Um, and as I said, in some cases, it's actually going to, uh, because in the Columbia paper, they make certain assumptions about the environment, in a real database system, their assumptions don't hold, and actually SIMD will hurt you. So we'll cover what that is, okay? And again, this is, this is the issue we're gonna have of getting things in and out of the registers are the reason why we may not always get the speed up we, 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 we'd want to achieve, okay? So now, part of the reason why it's gonna be tricky is that there's no magic flag in the compiler that's gonna take all our database, you know, our database system, all the source code, and be able to paralyze everything. Right? For, for simple things, maybe, but for the more complex things we're doing with to process queries, it's just, it's just not going to happen. So again, if we want to have uh, vectorization in our data system, people pay, you know, people pay you money to go do this, because right? uh, it's hard. Let's see how we could actually achieve this. So the, the three ways are the automatic vectorization from the compiler, and then we can then pass hints to the compiler and tell us what, what we actually want. And then there's us writing uh, our source code with explicit vectorization using CPU intrinsics. Okay? So the way to think about this is like the easiest one to use is the one at the top because that's just hoping the compiler figures it out. The one at the bottom is the hardest to use, but we'll have complete control of what's going into our registers, what's coming out, and what instructions we're executing. So again, easy to use, better, better control, but harder to write. Okay? All right. So, Automatic vectorization is just saying that where the compiler can identify when we have uh, chunks of source code that inside of a loop where the kernel, of, uh, the, the, the main operation inside that loop could then be converted into a vectorized instruction. And so for really simple loops, this is, this is going to be easy to do. Um, but the problem is simple loops are not going to be very common in the, the main thing we want to speed up, which is query execution. All right? So, and obviously, this requires your hardware to have support for CPU instru or SIMD instructions, but pretty much every, you know, every modern you know, Intel chip has that today. And whether you have 256 or 512, it's... Uh, actually, I don't know what the laptops have. Um, probably just AVX2. But any modern Xeon you, know, you buy today will have 512. All right, so let's look at an example here. So here we have a for loop here, uh, and this is sort of like the, the vector-wise primitives we talked about before, where they were going to have the predefined source code uh, to do... The, the basic, basic operations you would need to execute a query, to process, you know, process data. So what is this doing? This is taking three pointers, x, y, and z, it's that same thing we showed in the very beginning, and then we're just going to iterate over every element x and every element of y and write them to an alpha up, up buffer z. So my question to you guys is, is this something the compiler can automatically vectorize? You're shaking your head yes. Why? What's that? He's saying loop unrolling, but that's not... That's not but that's not, that's not in using SIMD instructions. After loop unrolling, you can. All right, so, so he said after you unroll the loop, you, say I, I, you would recognize I have four lane SIMD, instruction, or SIMD registers, so I unroll it four times, and then I, uh, and then, and then, you know, then I can vectorize that. Who, who, who agrees or disagrees? Well, isn't the one issue just that, like, these pointers, right? So there are another location to take all that side effects. Bingo, that's it, yes. So, it is not legal to automatically vectorize this because he's exactly right that you don't know what these are at compile time, right? And it may be the case that these are actually pointing to the same chunks of memory. So now you have unpredictable side effects of when you actually start doing your computation. Yes? You could do global analysis to figure out. You said you could do global analysis to prove that they're different. Uh, does that... That's not a static, you can't do that a static, statically at compile time. 
You can do it afterwards, sure. You can run it and go. You can run your database system with this function, check it, all right? And you, like, you may never see the case where these are actually pointing to the same thing, but you don't know that because you don't know you have you don't know whether you've seen all possible inputs to the database system. Yes. Ah, interesting. So you're, you're basically claiming, can you do optimistic uh, vectorization where the compiler could insert some kind of magic here, do the vectorized version, or somehow do some analysis on what these guys are, and see whether this would have gotten stomped on inside the vectorized version. And then if, if, if no, go ahead and keep my result. If yes, go back and do the scalar version. Yeah. Or like, for that matter, just like check to see if there's like different pointers and like essentially the make sure that they're all different and that like they're not overlapping in memory or something like that and then perform that check if so, if that passes then do a vector at three. I mean the problem is like well if you pass like think what you're, you're saying so so I'm just showing this as like a global variable but you'd have to pass that in right to this to this to this function so that you would then know and then you have to know that all right I'm going to loop through uh, from 0 to to max for each of these things then check that yeah max also has to be not yeah, I, that, that sounds like a lot of work. Yes? Maybe it's not possible in database, but I wrote this, and it's possible doing a list of analysis, like if you know like everything. If you do what, sorry? Uh, if, 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 you analysis, if you know all possible inputs. Alias analysis. Alias analysis. It's possible. I, let's, let's talk about that afterwards. I, I, I don't actually what, what, what you're claiming. But I mean, the really simple issue is like if, my, if z is just the, 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 the memory location of x plus 1, What's going to happen here? Now I take x, x uh, and y, and I write that into z. But now when I come back, I'm clobbering uh, for the second loop. Now I'm clobbering the, 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 the second element of x. And that's going to produce completely incorrect results. Right? We want to be able to vectorize this such that the output of the vectorized version has to be exactly the same as the, as the scalar version. Right? So the reason why this is difficult to do for a compiler to handle uh, is it's just the nature of how we write C, C++, right? We're writing this code in a way that we're describing this algorithm or this computation we want to do in, in sequential terms. Iterate over one element at a time, take two numbers, add them together, write it to this, to this buffer. So that's, again, that's, that's, C is just sort of not set up to provide the correct hints to the compiler to recognize that they could do this. You have to do whatever he's proposing to do or the next things that, that I'm describing, the compiler hints, okay? So again, the main takeaway from this is GCC and Clang are not going to be able to vectorize that much. ICC from, um, from Intel, their proprietary compiler is, is much more better at this. But even then, in many cases, it's not going to be able to do it because it's not going to know what's going on here. All right, so what can we do? Again, so we can provide compiler hints to tell the, uh, the compiler that we know that there's, there's this piece of code that's safe to, for it to operate on in, in a vectorized manner, right? And so the, the two basic ways we can do this is either tell the compiler something that we know about the, the memory locations that we could be, ever be passing into this function, or we just tell the compiler, hey, you know, t take, you know, you know, unbuckle your seatbelt, take the, take the safety off your gun, like, like just go buck wild and do whatever you want. I don't care, right? So uh, the first one is the restrict keyword. And this is a flag we can add to in, in, in our C code or C++ code that basically says that we know that these are distinct memory locations, and therefore it's safe for it to vectorize any, anything that comes below this. So this is in the C standard. I don't know whether it's, I don't think it's in the C++ standard, but as far as I know, as I've tested before, it, it's like GCC and Clang will, 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 will handle this, right? So again, this is basically saying that we're allowing the programmer to declare that these pointers are, will, will never share the same data or you know, the same memory locations, and therefore, Anything that we do under here will, will, will not have weird side effects that's, that's unexpected, right? But of course, it's going to be up to us as the programmer to make sure that we know what we're doing when we, when we tell it, hey, don't check these things. Uh, because, you know, after it's already compiled, there, we have no way to protect, you know, enforce that. The other approach are these, these pragma hints. And this is just basically saying that uh, within this function, it, you don't do any of those mem the, 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 the memory checks. This is like sort of a, a more um, sort of a more not a brute force, but a more coarse-grained 
definition that it's okay to do vectorization here, whereas in the restrict keyword, you know, it's more fine-grained on individual elements, right? So this one is saying, uh, IV depth is saying ignore vector, vectorization dependencies. There's other ones, uh, I think other languages like SIMD on, SIMD off. I, 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 don't know how, I don't know how portable this one is. I think this might be working for GCC. I don't know what, whether Clang or ICC do something different, right? Um, or like if you're using these other like libraries like OpenMP, they have their own, own flags. It's, they're, all, they're all essentially doing the same thing, right? Okay. So again, the main takeaway from this is that we can, we can tell the compiler we, we can, what we can do, uh, what it can do, but it's, it's still up for us as the Davis developers to, to protect ourselves. The last one is through explicit vectorization where we're going to write the, the, the exact SIMD instructions that we want to execute. And again, we have to know what the register size is. We have to know what the, the data type we're operating on. Um, and then now there's, there's no question about what to actually do because these, these intrinsics are essentially syntactic sugar that the, the compiler replaces with the exact instruction to do whatever it is that we're asking to do. The downside of, of intrinsics is that they're not portable. Meaning, if, if my code, if I compile, if I write all the x86 intrinsics, but I'm not running now, I'm compiling my data system to ARM, they may, may not support that. Or if I'm compiling my code and it operates on the AVX512, but then I try to compile it on a machine that doesn't have those registers, it's going to fail. Or it might actually replace them with the scalar version of, of the operation if it's nice, uh, and I may not get you know, the, the vectorization that, I, you know, that I'm expecting. So here's the. Uh, Here's the SSE implementation of the, uh, actually this is MMX. The, the, this is a SIMD implementation of the same, same, uh, the, you know, the same form and, and, then, and then adding together the different vectors. And now you see what I have to do is I have to take my sort of C++ plus vectors of, of numbers and then convert them into the, the expected SIMD register vectors, right? And then this operation here is now doing the addition or loading things in. It's doing the addition uh, on 32-bit integers and then loading it into this, this SIMD vector here. Right? It's ugly. The, the double underscore is, 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 what, is how, we de how at least GCC defines intrinsics. I think Clang does the same thing. Um, and so, again, you, you can hide this with like, like a library that has a bunch of macro tricks to make you, make you do this, but there's no sort of one library that everyone uses. If you look at GitHub, you see, a lot of times you see explicit instructions like this. Okay? So for our purposes in our own system and in the clump paper you guys read, they're going to do this explicit ve vectorization because they want to have, again, fine-grained control of exactly what the CPU is doing. All right. So now that we know how to write SIMD uh, instructions, what are the kind of SIMD operations we could do? So the first thing we need to talk about is, like, what direction are we applying our vectorization? So the difference is horizontal versus vertical. So with horizontal, the idea is that we're going to apply some operation on all the elements together that are within a single vector and then produce some, some single output or scalar output. So like, say I want to take uh, my, my register that has the number 0, 1, 2, 3, and then I can invoke a SIMD horizontal instruction that just takes all the elements in my vector and then produce a single scalar output that's the sum of all of them. So this one is only found in the new instructions that support SSE4 and AVX2. Um, so that's roughly 2015, 2016. Anything, or, or anything newer than that should have it. The next one is the vertical one. Uh, and the idea here is that we're going to take two vectors, apply some SIMD instruction on them, uh, and we're going to match up based on the offsets when the, when the vector. So this is offset 0, this is offset 0, and then we'll add them together, and then we'll write that out to offset 0 in, in our output vector. So the Columbia paper is going uh, 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 to do everything based on this. Um, I forget why they said they, di they didn't do this. I think at the time, I think they actually, the CPU they looked on, they didn't have it. All right? This one, so again, this, this is the more common approach. All right, so now, so going forward, we're going to assume that we have these intrinsics, that we're going to do these, the, vert the vertical uh, vectorization, and now we want to do a bunch of different things in our, in our, uh, in our database system to construct primitive operations that are vectorized. And then we'll build up from those primitives and do the more complex things like the joins and the scans and the other stuff that, that you would want in a, uh, in a you know, one I have to do when you process queries. So again, I like this paper because it's just, it's like everything. 
like here's all the different techniques and the, the of, uh, the, and actually the source code and implementations of how you, how, you, how you design all these algorithms and data structures to take advantage of vectorization. All of them we're not going to need, uh, but I, I want to cover like sort of the main the main primitives. Okay. So, again, as, as I've already just said this. So this is all about how can we can do primitive operations that are vectorized and then do more advanced algorithms and functionality in our database system. Um, the system they're going to run on is actually not a full-fledged database system. It's just like a little testbed prototype that does, you know, it's sort of hand-coded to do the one operation that they're, they're trying to measure. So that means there's no SQL parser, there's no transactions, there's no query processing. And it also means that they're not going to materialize the output in those cases, which oftentimes is, is a big overhead in, in, in implementations. The other big thing, and this is the big assumption that I was saying before, is that in their operating environment, they're going to assume that the database fits entirely in the CPU cache. That is not realistic, right? Because like L1 is like 32 kilobytes, L3 I don't know, it's like maybe 64 megabytes uh, if you have a lot of money. Like, there's no database that's going to fit in all your CPU caches. And what you'll see in the next paper you read after the spring break is that if everything now does not fit in the CPU cache, this SIMD stuff actually doesn't, doesn't matter at all, right? Unless you start doing the, 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 the relaxed operator fusion stuff that, that we'll, they'll read about next, like of how to actually, you know, um, sort of stage your operations so that you can operate on vectors uh, within your CPU caches. And then you can prefetch the next piece of, the next vector you're going to operate on to hide that latency of the memory stall. In their world, they don't do any of that. It's just like everything's my CPU cache. Let me rip through it very quickly. Okay? The other big thing that they're going to have in their design decision for their algorithms is that they want to maximize the lane utilization so that for every single time you invoke an instruction, you're always doing useful work for all the data items in your vectors. All right, this will make more sense when we talk about how they do uh, the hash table probing. But the idea is that I don't want to say I can put four elements into my vector, but only two of them are, I, or one of them I actually need. The, the rest are actually garbage I can throw away. They want to pack in all you know, all unique data or useful data in every single register for every single instruction so that they're, they're maximizing uh, the, the utilization. All right, so let's start with the fundamental operations that, that, they're, that they're going to define, select the load, select the store, and then the gather and scatter. And then we'll see how we can then use these to do the scans and the hash tables and, and the histograms, okay? So uh, with, with selective load, uh, the idea here is that we want to take some... Uh, some, some chunk of memory we have in our, in our L1 cache, and then we want to write them out to a register. But we want to provide this mask to tell us what elements we actually want to store. Because right? without this, we'd have to take everything and, and write it out, like all, all contiguously. Which means that if we only want certain items, we'd have to copy it, then, you know, in, 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 in all in our CPU cache, then align things the way we want and then write it into our register. So the idea is like we can take a chunk of memory that has some things we want and don't want, provide this mask, and this tells us how to populate the register. Right? So again, the lane is like this. The mask offset here corresponds to an offset in the vector. So the first thing we do is look at the first element in the mask. Uh, the bit is set to 0. So we're going to skip uh, what, what's, what's in here. Right? There's nothing else we, we want to write out into this lane. Then we get into the 1 here. And that's going to tell us at the first offset uh, that we've been writing into. So sort of think of like this. Every time we have a one, there's some cursor here that's going to copy out what's in the memory address, the memory location. And then when we move to the next bit, if there's another one, we would move the cursor over by one. So even though this is offset two or offset one in our vector, we're starting at offset zero for memory because we didn't we didn't write anything for offset zero. So now this would get mapped over that, and we write it up in here. And then the same thing for the next one. There's a zero, so we skip that. Now we have a 1, and then the cursor moves over here for this v, and then we write it to offset 3 up in, up in the vector. All right? The selective store is the opposite of this, uh, is where we have our vector, and we want to take the, its contents of its elements and write it out to, to, uh, to memory. So again, the lanes match up just as before. So we start here with the 0, and this is saying we don't want to copy anything. Then we get here to the 1. And it's going to take the same offset in the mass for the offset in the vector, but then we're going to write it to the first location in memory. And then same thing for this, skip to the 0, the 1, and write it up there. Right? So this is another, this is another spoiler of this, uh, uh, of this paper, is that 
there are no SIMD instructions. No, Xeon does not currently support doing this like, like with a single instruction. It has to be emulated doing other SIMD operations. And every year, I always Google to see whether, uh, check on Google to see whether selective store or selective uh, load has, has been implemented in, uh, in, in x86. And the only thing ever shows up are three things. Either the Columbia paper that describes the, the, the technique, the, my slides from this class, or people in Korea or Wisconsin who stole my slides uh, and, and talk about the same thing. Right? We'll see what they look like in a second. Um, so again. <laughs> And this means that also now you can't do this atomically. There's to be multiple instructions to, to make this work. And the idea of what they're doing is, the reason why you'd actually want this again is that I don't want to have to uh, you know, take the chunk of memory and, and, and copy things over, over and over again uh, to, to align it the way that I want before I load it, and write, uh, load it and take it out. Ideally, if I could do this in a single instruction, that'd be great, but it, it doesn't exist. All right, the next is going to be uh, the, the, the scatter and gather, right? So with gather, the idea is that, again, we have our index vector that lines up with our value vector, and we want, to take, uh, uh, we want to take elements that are in memory and then write them out into uh, different locations in, uh, in our vector, right? So think of these as offset from 0 to 5. So when I look at this thing here, the, the, va the index vector says at offset 2, right, which is here, write it into the first lane of my register. Then I get here, offset 1, take, take, you know, take uh, offset 1 in memory, write it out to, the, to the, the, the second lane or the first lane, depending on what offset you're looking at, into this, and so forth for all the other ones. And again, like, I don't think, actually, I think Xeon now supports both of these, the, the selective gather and the selective gather. There's a selective gather and scatter. So you can do this. It, it'll be a single instruction, but it won't be done in a single cycle because, again, L1 can only do a one or two loads and stores per cycle. So if I have a bunch of stuff that if I'm populating a large register, it may take a bunch of cycles to populate it up using this technique. Yes? So it's like emulating the selective like, load and storage, just making like, the index vector um, go a bunch of people five. I know. I, I don't think you emulate this. I think it actually supports this. Yeah. Right, but I mean, like, would, would you use that to emulate the load? Uh, could, could, you use, could you use selective gather to emulate the, to select the load and store from the last, yeah, yes. I, I don't know the exact details, I think the paper describes it. But it's, it's, there's, again, the main takeaway is that it's not one instruction like this is. Okay, scatter, again, is the opposite. Uh, we're going to take uh, elements in, uh, in our register and then write them out to different locations here. So for the first element here at index vector 2, then I'm writing it to memory location 2. And I do this, the same thing for everything else. Okay? So I've already said this a lot before. Uh, the, the gather and scatters are not really executed in parallel because we can only load so many things in, in a single cycle. Uh, the gathers are only supported in the, the newer, uh, well, newer, it's, since 2014 is when AVX2 came out in the Hoswell. Prior to that, uh, it wasn't supported. And then, again, these are, you have to implement these or emulate them using uh, multiple, multiple CPU instructions. Okay? All right, so let's get to the good stuff. All right, so we have these primitives now, and let's talk about how we can do scans, hash tables, and, and do partitioning for histograms. The paper also talks about how to do join, sorting, and bloom filters. Uh, I, don't think they, I don't know whether they talk about how to do uh, SIMD hash functions, but we'll cover that later too as well. But we will cover these after the spring break, because we'll talk about how to do this in, in the, the, part, the radix partition hash join or the uh, botonic sorting techniques uh, when we talk about sort merge join. So we'll cover these in more detail after, after spring break. And I think we'll also talk about this, but th this one's pretty easy to figure out as well. Okay? So again, Nothing's going to work because they're going to assume, well, they're going to assume everything is fit in CPU cache. They're also going to make this other big assumption, I should have mentioned this earlier, is that they're going to operate, they're going to assume all their keys are 32 bits and all their pointers to tuples are 32 bits because, again, they're operating on 256-bit uh, registers. And so for a key and value pair, it has to be 64 bits. In a real data in memory database system, the values are or sorry, the values are gonna be the tuple slots or the tuple pointers, those are gonna be 64 bits. And then keys are often not just gonna be uh, you know 32 or 64 bits. Sometimes you can have composite keys. And if you have those, then then many of these techniques don't work. Because now you can't align things nicely into lanes in, in the SIMD register. Right? Alright, so 
Let's how to do uh, vectorized selection scans. So we saw these two examples before uh, when we talked about query processing. Right? This is how we can do a, a branching version and a, and a branchless version of doing the scan. Right? For the branching version, you have an if clause where you check the predicate first, and then if it matches, then you, then you copy the tuple and then the output buffer. And then the branchless version, you always copy it, and then you then check, this, you check it by using this you know, uh, bitwise area, you know, comparison operation, so it's not really a branch. And then based, based on the output of, of, of this comparison, that tells you whether you, you increment the offset of the output vector by one or zero, which then determines whether if you come back around, you overwrite the last one you, you, you copied into because you don't want it there. All right? And we saw this, uh, this graph from the vectorwise people where the, the branchless version of the algorithm always has almost a fixed cost because you're doing the same amount of work no matter what the selectivity is of, of the predicate. And then in the, the branching case, when you have low selectivity uh, or very high selectivity, then it, it, it'll do better than the branchless one. But in this middle part here, you know, the, the branch misprediction penalty we're paying in our CPU becomes higher and higher. And therefore, you know, uh, those cache stalls or the pipeline flushes of having to, to, to you know, undo our, our mispredicted branch starts, you know, becomes a big bottleneck, right? So in a vectorized selection scan operation, we can't do the branching version because there is no notion or no concept of if clauses in our, uh, in our SIMD instructions. So they're going to have to do a vectorized branchless version. So this is a gross approximation of, of what the algorithm is, but now we're going to scan through our table, and whereas before I would get one back, one tuple at a time, now I'm going to get back a vector tuples. I'm not saying what, what, the, what the register size is, whether it's four, four elements or 16 elements or eight, whatever, it doesn't matter, we get a vector. And then we're going to load the key we want to do a comparison on, again, assuming we, we only need to look at one key, we'll load this into a, a key vector in, in, in SIMD, and you know, this is just, again, syntactic sugar. This is not actually really, really how you write this code. There's no SIMD load function. Then we do our, our, the same comparison we did in the branchless scan, where we're doing the bit manipulation to see whether we match or not. But then we're writing our mask out uh, to, our, to our, our register here. And this is saying if, a, if the tuple at the offset in our, in our vector we got from the table, if that satisfies our predicate, it'll be set to 1. If it doesn't satisfy a predicate, it's set to zero. Then now we take that mask and now do the selective store to the copy the tuples we want that match our, 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 match our predicate and are in our mask to our output buffer. And then we just take the, uh, we take the cardinality of the number of, of, of ones we have in our, our mask vector, and that tells us what our offset should be. And again, there's more, loop out, there's more work we have to do outside the for loop to make sure that we don't keep around things that didn't match in the last iteration but I'm ignoring that for now. So again, this would be a, a SIMD uh, load. This would be a SIMD comparison. This would, this would be a two instructions, because you have to do uh, the vectorized greater than or equal to and the vectorized less than or equal to. But again, that's just hanging out in, in our SIMD registers, and that, that's not a big deal. And then this is a SIMD store to now take the, the, the selective store mask from, that we produced from this, take our tuples, and write it to our output buffer. And this would be sitting in, in memory. Yes? Offset in the output buffer, right? So here, uh, this tells again. This is telling, but this is, we have this output buffer here, and we keep track of i, and i is where the the starting location of where we should write tuples that match, right? It's actually easier to understand if you go back to the the scalar version, right? Oh, shit. Mm, there we go. Right. So i equals zero. I always copied into uh, the current offset i. If the tuple matches, then this M flag will be set to 1. So therefore, I want to keep whatever I copied in here. So I add, add M to I, which is plus 1, so that when I come back around, now I'm writing at the next offset, and I'm not clobbering with the last thing I copied in. If this doesn't match, then it's 0. Then I overwrite the next time I come around, because I didn't want to keep the last thing I wrote. Thank you. So in the vectorized case, this operation here, you want to count the number of ones you have. That's going to tell us how to, to, to move the offset forward. And you can actually do this. There's a, it's, a, it's called the rank instruction. You can do this in, in the CPU actually very efficiently. You can take a vector of things and say, get, count the number of ones in it. That's a, sort of an example of uh, horizontal vectorization. All right, so let's look, let's look at a real example of this. Okay? So let's say now we replace our query, put in real values. 
we want to find all the matching tuples where the key is greater than or equal to O and the key is less than the letter U. So let's say now our, our, ta our table looks like this, right? We have the key J O Y S U X. And so the, in order to do this comparison, we're going to first copy this into our key vector, right? And that's this, this, this step here. Then now we do our SIMD compare, right? And that's this part here. And we're going to get, back our get out our mask. And this is going to tell us which of these keys actually matched. Uh, and then now we have this pre-computed offset map, right? This is just something we can predefine in our source code ahead of time. And this is just saying the offset at, at you know, the implicit offset here corresponds to the offset zero in memory, right? And up to, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So then now we use this to do our, our SIMD selective store. And that's, again, what this is saying here, if I have uh, a one here, and I would know that the offset I'm matching here should go into the first location here. So now, these are just offsets here. So I'm, I'm matching that, like, all right, the tuple that, the, the key that matched my SIMD compare at this offset can be found, you know, I'm writing what that offset is. So now then I got to go back now and say, well, I have offsets one, three, four. If I need to materialize the keys up above in my, my query plan tree, I go back in here and, and jump to that offset to copy out the, the actual key. Right? Is this clear? So, in my opinion, this, this is like the most useful thing you'll probably get out of this lecture in terms of like, here's something actually you, you can do in a data system, because we actually do this now in, in our own system. Right? And the magic is this offset, a pre-computed offset thing. So again, as I said, uh, if you go Google Selective Store, you'll find the, the Columbia paper, my slides, and then people have copied my slides. And the reason why I know they copied my slides is they don't know what this is. They always include this. J-U-Y-S-U-X. Joy was my first PG student, right? So that's why his name's in here. So you go look at a bunch of other slides, and sure enough, like, Joy sucks, right? Joy sucks. I guess they, they copied the entire uh, the algorithm, right? <laughs> anyway, I, I don't care. It's fine. Um, all right. So let's see what you performance benefit you can actually get from this. So for this one, they're going to do four lane SIMD registers, and they're going to actually compare against two CPU architectures. So this one here, the Xeon Phi, who here has ever heard of the Xeon Phi? Well, you, your dad works at Intel, but some, very few people, right? Xeon Phi was a coprocessor that Intel used, used to sell uh, that sort of look, comes in a bunch of different form factors. The easiest way to think about it was like, it was like their version of a GPU that was meant for highly parallel computation. So it wasn't like, you wouldn't get a, you know, you know, thousands of cores as, as you would from a, uh, you know, from, a, from, from NVIDIA on their GPUs, you get maybe like 60 or 70 uh, cores. But these cores were actually more complex than a GPU core. They were basically like the Intel Pentium 4 architecture or like the Atom architecture later on. So like they're low powered, very simple, uh, but you'll get more than, you know, more cores than, than you get on the Xeon. So you could have it sit down, sit, you could have it buy one, you could have it sit down on the, uh, the PCI Express bus, like a, like a GPU, but they had, did have ones that could sit up on, on the motherboard and the socket. Like this one here, you could actually have it run the operating system based on, you know, on the Xeon 5. It didn't need like a, the Xeon to drive everything. And this one here just has this little Omnipath connector so that you can do like remote, remote memory access to, a, to a, a, another, another machine, right? Intel killed this off, I think last year or two years ago. Uh, uh, they were roughly around I don't know, five thousand dollars or so. All right, it was it was an interesting uh, experiment. But for, for 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 machine learning, the the GPUs were way better. All right, so the main thing though I want to point out though is the Xeon Five they're going to run here is going to be a it's an older version of the Xeon Five, so it's going to be do in order execution. So it can't do the out of order stuff that the Xeon can, and it can't do speculative execution. Right, so it's going to take your 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 pipeline and execute the instructions one after another, right? And, and, it, and it can't do the, uh, does it do? Yeah, it, it doesn't do, it doesn't do uh, branch prediction and do, do, do spec of execution. So if you have a jump and you have to flush your address pu pipeline, then you know, that, that gets expensive. So we're gonna have four variants of the selection scan. So we're gonna do the scalar version uh, with 60 instructions, the branching versus the branchless, and then we'll have the vectorized version, which is always gonna be branchless, but they'll do one with early materialization and late materialization. This just means, do I need to copy the, the tuple after I match the offsets? Do I need to copy and materialize it into to a buffer to pass it up to the next, uh, the next operator in the query plan? But again, it's not a full-fledged database system, so they, there is no other, nothing else after they do the scan, right? 
All right, so the first thing here you see is that uh, the, the Xeon Phi is going to outperform the, uh, the Xeon uh, for the, the branching case and the branchless case because this is the, the scan op is actually it's a pretty simple instructions we're doing in our for loop, and this, this thing just has way more cores, right? I always think this is a typo, right? Like, it's, this thing has 61 cores. It, it, I don't know why it's a, that weird number. It's not 60 or 62 or 64, right? It's 61, whatever, right? And then this Xeon here, I think it has, it's four cores, but it's hyperthetic. So this just has way more cores. The for loop is, is pretty straightforward, so it can rip through uh, things more quickly. But this now shows you an important difference between the, the, the benefit you get from branchless versus branching when you can do in order versus out of order execution. So again, the, Z, the, the Xeon CPU has uh, the out of order execution, it has the, the, the spec of execution and the branch prediction. So in that case, the, 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 the branchless one is, 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 is going to do much better right? For this, as you scale up the selectivity. All right? Sorry, as, as the selectivity gets lower. Um, I don't know why this doesn't arc like the other one. Oh, yeah, because in this case here, you, you run out of CPU cache. Right? So think of this as like 0, 1, 2, 5, 10. This is like that first part of the graph I showed from vector-wise. And then when you go beyond 20 or 50, that's when it crosses. So that's why, that's why it, you know, they, they converge there. In the case, again, the Xeon Phi, they don't have that branch misprediction. Uh, or the, the, the spec of execution. So like copying everything every single time sucks in their world because it's a lot of waste of work when your selectivity is really low, right? So here again, when you have the selectivity at 100%, the memory bandwidth on both of these uh, is what you're paying the penalty for, just trying to get the data in and off of, of your CPU caches. So it, it doesn't make a difference in either algorithm. For the vectorized one, uh, what you see is that the in the case of the, with late materialization, for both of these, it's going to perform the best. It's no surprise because I, I'm not copying tuples that match. Like I'm just doing less work. Um, but you have a more pronounced difference between the early materialization and the late uh, and versus late materialization on the two architectures. Again, for this one, because in, in this world, the, because the CPU is, is quite simple, the copy instructions become, uh, become expensive. And like, you, you know, you, you just, you're doing a lot, the, the cost of doing wasted work uh, becomes more expensive. And then everything converges down to the, the same performance when you, you, know, you, you start maxing out the memory bandwidth. Right? So here's a good example also too of like, as I was saying, like, it doesn't matter whether you're fancy with SIMD or not, like, if the query and the data are not uh, amenable to doing vectors operations, it, it, it doesn't help you. Right? This is also another good example of what I was saying in the beginning about how you never achieve the, the theoretical performance improvement you could possibly get with vectorized instructions. So in this case here, the, on the Xeon, this is doing, I don't know, roughly 2.5, 2.6 uh, billion tuples per second. But the SIMD version is doing, you know, rounding up six. So it's getting less than a 3x improvement, but we said we had a, f uh, a, f a 4x uh, CMD registers, so this should really be, if we're actually achieving that full, full uh, parallelization, we should have been 4x faster, and we're not. Because again, it's that cost of moving things in and out of the registers that we pay a penalty for. So just because we vectorize maybe one piece of it, doesn't, and the rest of it's not vectorized, uh, that, that's going to be a, a, a bottleneck for us. Okay? Alright, so let's look at some other things we do. Hash tables is another one. I think it's really interesting that they talk about this uh, and they come up with some interesting techniques. Again, this one we definitely uh, evaluate it and it definitely does not work once you're at a CPU cache. All right, so say we want to do, uh, do a probe in our hash table and we're doing linear probing. So we have, in the scalar version, we have a single input key. We'll, do, we'll hash it, produce some offset uh, for a slot number in our hash table. We'll go jump to that offset, take whatever key's inside of it, compare it with our key, see whether they match. If we, if we find a match, we're done. If not, then we just keep scanning down until we, until we find a slot that's either empty, meaning we, we know our key's not in there, or we find the one that, that we're looking for, right? So again, you, the only thing you can really vectorize in this particular example, you can vectorize this, right? There are, the, the, the hyper guys have a vectorized hash function, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, when we talk about joins, but like, that's not the expensive part. The expensive part is, is doing this comparison and jumping through memory in the hash table. 
So let's see how we can, we can vectorize this uh, using vertical, uh, or sorry, horizontal vectorization. So what we're going to do now in our hash table, we're going to expand out the number of elements we're storing uh, per slot. So within each slot, we'll have four keys, and then they'll have, we'll have four values. So now when we, when we take a single key, we hash it, we get our hash index, we jump to that location, we're going to get back four keys. Then we can do our SIMD compare, get, get back our match mask, and then we check to see if any one of them is, is one, then we know, uh, we know we, that we have a match, we know how to find the offset of our matching key. If they're all zero, then we know that there's nothing in this slot that, that we have, and we just jump down to the next location and then do the same vectorized comparison. All right? So, for this one, uh, this one, to me, this seems like actually a really good idea. It turns out not to be, not to work, um, because there's just, there's just so much extra overhead of, of the cost of going getting these things and scanning and, and, and ripping through them, uh, you know, copying this into the SIMD registers, like that, that's the penalty you're paying. Yes? Did you try prefetching, like, in this thing, like, if you directly run it, definitely I can understand the cache thing will be a problem. But did you try, like, when the first cache block is running, you are prefetching the second thing? So his statement is, did we try software prefetching on this, where I'm here, and then I'm going to assume that I'm not going to match, and therefore I'm going to prefetch the next thing? But what if I match? Then I just prefetch some crap, and I polluted my CPU cache, and it, and it doesn't work. Like, this is, like, hash tables are so random that it's, like, it's hard to say like, what you actually should do. It doesn't, like, in, in our experiments, it doesn't work. Even prefetching Pre prefetching doesn't help, yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's see how to do this with uh, vertical vectorization. So before, we were taking one key and then looking for that key in, in, our, you know, in the, needle, the single needle in our haystack. Now with vertical vectorization, we're going to take m multiple keys at the same time and do our search uh, in, in parallel for them. So we'll take four keys here. We'll run uh, four hash functions. And so this you have to do scalar. Right? There's no SIMD instruction to do you know, a four-lane hash. Again, we can vectorize the hash function itself, uh, the operations within the hash function, but like, there's no like, murmur hash or, or, or you know, x, x, x hash that can be run entirely in SIMD uh, for, for multiple elements. So we're going to run this as a for loop, a rip through this. We can unroll the loop if we wanted to, uh, and we'll get four uh, locations in our hash function or hash table. We dial jump to those locations and then do the SIMD gather to put them into a single vector. And then now we can do our, our SIMD compare and check to see whether we, we have a match. And that's going to produce an offset, uh, sorry, produce a bit mask to, that is going to be one if our keys match or zero if our keys don't match. But now what's the problem here? Well, so in my last case, when I'm looking at one key at a time, if, the, if that one key matches, I'm done. If that key doesn't match, then I jump down to the next one. But now I have... Two of them match, two of them doesn't, don't match. Yes? You, like, here, the first and fourth will store something, but for the rest two, you have to go on still to find the right. Yeah, so he said, like, and this, this is this, uh, this notion of that they always wanted to uh, have full utilization of all the lanes. So these guys match. So I don't need to go look anywhere else in, in, the, in the hash to, see, to find a match for them. These guys don't match, so I, so I, I have to go look for them. So... One thing I could do is just keep these guys or keep, you know, keep these keys in my register. Everyone jumps down to one offset in, in, their, in the corresponding location in the hash table, bring those new keys in and do a comparison. And no matter what the first key and the last key produce as the comparison, I ignore that because I know that I already found them. But now that's, again, that I'm getting 50% utilization because I'm doing useless computation on those keys because I already knew I found a match. So I'm, just, I'm doing un unnecessary work. Again, so the other, you know, other thing could be just, like say three out of four match, and so I keep scanning. Maybe I, I loop through the entire thing to find that that, that the key, the, the last key, doesn't never matches, and now I just wasted all this work. So what they're going to do is they're going to maintain some internal bookkeeping to keep track of. All right, well these guys matched, and therefore now I need to go get two new keys to replace them. They're going to go back over here, replace the input key vector with the next two elements that are in our column. Uh, rerun our hash function, and for the, 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 the second and third key, I, the hash function is really just saying, take the last location and add one to it, because I'm moving down to the next location in, in the slot array. 
but I get a new starting location for the, the, the first and the last key, and then do this all over again, jump to those locations, fill up my, my vectors, and then do my SIMB compare. Right? Yes? Is multiplicative hashing possible to do with SIMD? Does, can you go, can you do multiplicative hashing with SIMD? Uh, across multiple keys at the same time? Yeah. I, I don't know the answer. Uh, we'd have to check. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, because, the, you know, there's the trade-off of, like, collisions versus speed. I, I think the collision rate might be kind of high on that. Yeah. We could try. Um, all right. Um, so this is also not going to work, too, when, when, you, when you, you don't fit in your CPU caches, because, again, all this bookkeeping overhead to go back get new keys and fill them in is going to be expensive. Um, there's another issue with this, this implementation that is a bit more nuanced on the engineering side. I don't know if anybody caught that when they read the paper. Like, what's one problem you'd have with this if you're like the person building a database system and want to use this algorithm? Yes? Is it concurrent control? No, it was, ignore all that. The issue is going to be that the, the probing algorithm is not going to be stable Meaning, for the same data set and the same query, we, we could get different ordered results every single time we run that query. Now, okay, well, relational models unordered, right? So, so this is, we're not supposed to really care about the order. But, like, if I'm trying to actually debug stuff and trying to understand, all right, well, somehow the, the data I'm writing to one register gets, you know, one location gets clobbered, but another one doesn't. Like, if every single time I'm getting you know, completely different random results, depending on what order these things match in my hash table, uh, then it could be hard to debug things. I, I somewhat agree with that. Uh, I, I don't know how much that, that is actually an issue. But this is something they said in the paper that of all of the algorithms, this is the only one that, that had this particular issue. Like the selective scan stuff we talked about doesn't have this problem. OK? All right, let's look at some performance results. So again, we're going to run the phi and the xeon. So they're, they're going to have the scalar hash probe and then the vectorized vertical and horizontal. Um, the, along the x-axis, they're going to increase the hash table size. So with the scalar version, the performance looks like this. Uh, and notice that the y-axis scales are different because the, the Xeon Fire has more cores than the other one. Um, the, when, again, we're going to see that, again, the difference, though, is that the vertical vectorization will be much better for the, for the Xeon Phi. Because it doesn't have the um, it doesn't have the, uh, the, the 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 branch misprediction error, like it's always going to sort of programmatically go through and do the you know the checks in the right in the same order. Whereas in the uh, in the horizontal case, you're you know you may have to check you know indirection or, or different uh, non-determinism in how you evaluate the keys. In the case of the uh, and the Xeon. I forget why there's this little crossing point here where the, the vertical stuff got, back to, got better than the, uh, the horizontal. But the main thing to point out here is that, as I saying before, once everything is not in your GPU cache, all of this doesn't matter. Right? So the, the, the Xeon Phi has a smaller cache than the, than the regular Xeon. So you hit this, this sort of convergence point much more, much more sooner. So again, this is what I was saying. I, I doubt software prefetching would help in this case. And the Xeon Phi, at least the older version stuff, they definitely did not have pre software prefetching. That's only in, in sort of modern Xeons. Modern in the last 10 years. OK? All right, the last thing I want to talk about uh, is how to do partitioning with histograms. And basically, the idea here is we can use scatter and gather to uh, do our histogram computation in parallel. So they say this is our input key vector. Uh, we're going to use a SIMD red radius instruction. It's, think of this sort of like in the same thing as a radix tree, where I just go grab one digit or one byte of each key, and I'm using that essentially as the hash function to tell me what my offset should be in. Like it's a it's a cheap poor man's hash function. And then now what I'm going to do is I take these these locations, and then I'm going to map them to some histogram, and I'll just do a simd add where I take whatever value was in the vector I'm writing into, and I and I add one to it, All right? For everything every for every matching. Uh, element within that location in the, in the vector I'm writing to. The problem is going to be, though, is that I have two keys mapping to the same location. And again, with SIMD, it's going to be atomic. So the 
the instruction is add one to this location based on what the previous value is. I can't, I can't, it's not, there's no for loop to say add one first time and add one again. It's like add one based on what the old value is. So we're losing one of these, one of these updates. So our counts are going to be wrong. So the way they can handle that is you do a SIMD scatter now to have each of these guys writing to different vectors, right? So this is the first vector for the first, key, for the first element. This is the next vector for the next element. And now they're doing the same thing we had before, but they're writing into the offset of the vector. But they're, now they're not clobbering each other because they're, they're only one, you know, one lane can write into one vector at a time. So now the only thing I, if, if I need to do is to compute what the final histogram it is, I just do a SIMD add to uh, do the computation across, across this way horizontally to, to produce the final result. All right, so I think, I think this is kind of cool. Okay? All right, so just to finish up quickly. Vectorization is super important for OLAP queries. Uh, we've already covered this. Nothing works when you're CPU cache. And then all the inter-query parallelism stuff that we talked about so far, plus the stuff we'll talk about when we start talking about joins, vectorization is just another tool we can add to speed things up. So in an, in an ideal case, an ideal system, you can do a query compilation with vectorization that also supports parallel queries. And in our system, we're, we're almost there. Hyper actually could not do vectorization. They can only do compilation and parallel queries. Right? Vector-wise can only do uh, eh, sort of pre-compiled. Eh. Some cases it helps, some cases it doesn't help. Uh, but they could, they could do vectorization. Yes? When we were doing concurrency control, did you say that Hyper has only one thread? That's for writes. The writes, they have only have a single thread. But for OLAP queries or read-only queries, they can run those in parallel. That's the morsel stuff we talked about when the, for the schedulers. OK, any questions about vectorization? All right, let's finish up with project three. OK, so the project three, the, pro, the goal is for you in your group to implement some substantial or large piece of, of, of software, component, or feature in the data system we've been working on for the first two projects. And the idea is that these projects should incorporate the various topics and techniques and methods and optimizations that we've talked about so far in the course, as well as whatever you're interested in your own sort of line of work or research or, or your, your hobby, if you want to bring that in as well, then I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Right? Because certainly I don't know everything about you know, anything outside databases. I'm very limited knowledge. So if you come along with something that, that, that I don't know about, it would be kind of cool to play with. I'm, I'm totally down with that. The important thing, though, is that whatever you pick for your project has to be unique from every other group. So I can't have two people, two groups also implementing constraints. Because the goal is we want to have your software be able to be merged back into the full system. So that you, know, so that, you, know, you can go off in, in the real world or go in the, in the job market and be able to say, look, you know, here's this piece of, this, of our database system that, 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 uh, that I helped implement. So what do you have to do? Well, there's, there's going to be a proposal. That'll be due uh, after the spring break. Then later on before the end of the semester, there'll be a, a status update with design documents. We'll also do code reviews with each other. Right, so you, you know, I'll talk about this in a second, but you, be, you have to look over other people's code and see whether they're doing stupid things, and then look at your code to see whether you're, do, you're doing stupid things. And there'll be a final presentation and then the code drop, which is submitting a PR on us on GitHub that has to cleanly merge into our master branch. So let's go through each of these. So for the first Monday after spring break, everyone, every group will come up here and they'll spend five minutes to talk about what you're, what you're proposing to, to build. So this is not just like at a high level, here's what I want to do you actually should spend time looking at the source code and try to come up with a good approximation of what will actually take for you to implement that particular feature or component. So you should know what files you need to modify or add, how you're actually going to test whether your implementation is working correctly, and then this is why I have you guys list in every single paper you read what workloads they used to evaluate their, their, their research. You should know about what workloads you want to use for your project. So right now, we can support some basic OTP workloads, TATP, small bank, and uh, YCSB. And we can support some queries in TPCH. Right, but if there's something else you want to evaluate, uh, let me know. We, we can figure something out. Then we'll have a checkpoint in April where, again, you come back up, spend five minutes, and tell everyone what you've done, what you've worked on, what the current status is of your project. Uh, if there's any change in uh, your plans because there's something in the system that like, was broken or not implemented or you found something else that was super interesting, then you talk about what, what those differences are. Um, and this is always fun, too. You, you, people can discuss, like, what are some surprises they found when they were start looking into the bowels of the system? Like, oh, I thought it was going to work this way, but it you know, did this way. Like, the BW tree has a memory leak, right? Well, that's not, that's not a surprise at this point, but like, like, things like that, right? 
And it's, what's also super useful about this is, and you'll see this, uh, this definitely has happened in previous semesters, is that sometimes one group will need uh, you know, sort of one feature, like, uh, like uh, we need a settings manager, uh, or a, 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 lock t a way to lock tables in a certain way, and another group might need the same thing. So then rather than you know, the two groups both implementing the same redundant piece of software, you guys could potentially work together, or maybe one group finished for the other group, and the other group could take their, take their code. So this is meant to be like a collaborative process. It's not like project one or project two where you're in competition with each other. Uh, it's meant to say, like, all right, we, we should all be working together and trying to make the thing better. The design document, I'll provide you guys with a template. And it's just written in Markdown. It's basically, it's a description of what, the, what your feature is or what your component actually is, why you designed it a certain way, you know, what are the different trade-offs that you had to consider for this implementation, and then future work for if anybody wants to come along and continue with, with your project, you know, what, what could it actually do? If you had more time, what would you actually do? And for those of you that are considering doing uh, like a capstone or independent study in the fall semester, this is also useful for you to write down what your state of mind was at the end of the semester, because you're going to go off in the summer and come back in the fall, and you're like, what the hell was I actually thinking back in April or May? And this is a good, you know, a good uh, reminder for yourself. For the code review, again, there'll be two rounds of code reviews. Again, I'll pair up different groups to, to look at each other's code, and we'll just use the, the pull request review process through, through GitHub. And I'll, I'll spend time in class to talk about what does it mean to actually do a code review. You know, it's not like things like, you know, you, you misspelled this word. Like, it's actually spending time to look at the code and try to figure out, you know, are, are they making reasonable assumptions or in, in their implementation. Um, and what I'll say also, too, is this is meant to be, everyone's meant to con contribute. So I don't want, for the, like the first code review, one person does it, and the second code review, the next person does it. Everyone should be contributing equally. And how we divide up the source code for what you want to look at, right, that'll vary uh, based on the project. Like certainly sometimes, it's this, if you do it on a, on a, on a file basis, sometimes clearly some, some files are more, been more modified than other files, and that may not be a good uh, way to divide things up. But we'll, we'll discuss ways to handle this. Final presentations will be, Whenever we're scheduled for the final exam, I think it's on Monday at like 8.30 or 5.30 p.m. We're not, we're not at the night. We're, we're, sorry, we're not in the morning, we're at the night. So we'll get pizza, we'll get food. But basically, you just show up and spend 10 minutes to say, here's what, what, what we've actually done. And in previous years, people have given demos. If you can do a demo for the status update, that's awesome too. Like to show like, hey, this thing actually does do what we say it does. Right? And now we actually support SQL in our system, so doing demos should be much easier for people. Uh, not project two, project three. Um, so, the way it's going to work, though, is it's not like other classes where you can write some code uh, that's sitting in your private GitHub repo or, or your, 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 your laptop, and then no one ever sees it, nobody ever cares. You have to make sure your code actually can merge into the master branch right, to get a final grade. And the reason why we do this is just because, one, you know, it gives you visibility about what you're doing, because if you want to go get a job at a database company, and then sometimes they email me and say, hey, do you know the student? What do they do? And I can point to your project, and here's the actual source code. Um, so we want to, so some cases we want to merge some code, sometimes we don't, but at least th there's a PR that can cleanly merge, passes all the tests, uh, and that we can point to as like the final body of work. And like, we're not a company, we're not, uh, you know, we're not trying to sell this software, but we're still trying to do high quality software engineering to the extent that we can in academia. And I think this is, you know, actually I had a student come back um, who's doing an internship at, at a database company now and was surprised at how uh, messy the commercial source code they were looking at versus, versus our source code. Um, and so I like to think that like, you know, going through this process, you get at least you know, appreciate what, is, what does it take to actually write you know, clean and reasonable source code. So it has to merge into the mess branch, and they have to have, you know, we, we do all the clang tidy, clang format, and the doxygen checks as well. Now, the tricky thing is going to be, of course, if there's conflicts between different groups because they modify the same file, uh, how we determine if we're going to merge things, who gets to merge first. This one we'll just do at random or we're taking on a case-by-case -case basis. Our success rate has been about 50%. So 50% of the student projects in previous years have merged into the master branch. Okay? Well, in terms of resources, again, we'll get you more uh, credits for Amazon. Uh, if you submit a PR to our main repo, that'll fire off builds on Travis and Jenkins. We're probably gonna drop Travis because we're running, the build's taking too long, um, but the Jenkins one will cover like, you know, OS X and, and Ubuntu. Um, if you think you need special hardware, uh, which I think this year there shouldn't be anything, um, let me know and we can see what we can do, okay? All right, and then you already guys know this story. It's a work in progress. A bunch of things aren't going to work, 
some things are maybe broken, but we'll fix it as we go along. All right, so let's talk about pr uh, potential topics. So let's go through these. There's a bunch of these. Let's go one by one. So the first one is for a query, the query optimizer. So we have a full Cascades query op optimizer. You'll, you'll learn what the Cascades actually means in, in a few more lectures. Um, so this project would actually be working on the internals of the optimizer to add support for uh, more complex queries, more complex transformations, uh, things like adder joins, which I think we, this might be fixed. But nested queries, we need to potentially improve our cost model. Actually, we definitely we know we need to improve our cost model for how we can uh, determine whether one plan is better than another. Um, but I would say, like, I can go more details later on about what the kind of things you could do with this. Uh, but if you do work on the query optimizer, the, you have to, the very first thing you have to do is also send me your CV because, or resume, because this is the one thing all the database companies want to hire. You saw that if you were in the intro class last year or last semester, the guy from Oracle came and he said, like, yeah, we don't want JavaScript programmers. We want, we want query optimizer people, right? And I also get emails like this. Like, this is from a pretty famous database person at, at a database startup. Uh, and he's like emailing a bunch of people, and I was on the list, although I'm not a senior database person, but whatever. But he's like, hey, does anybody know there's like any loose query optimizer people we, we could hire? And because they're super hard, because like query optimization was a big thing in the 80s and 90s, and it's like these old white dudes that are, you know, that like, you know, are not very likely to leave, to leave, leave companies uh, and go join startups. So people cannot hire these, these places fast enough. And like all the NoSQL database companies that were like, oh, we don't need a query optimizer, we're just gonna do, you know, get them sets and JSON. Like, they then soon realize, oh, we do need a query optimization, uh, query optimizer, and so people are uh, struggling to find them. So again, this, this guy was a bit more vulgar with, with his request, but same thing. He wanted to hire people to do, to find query optimizers. Uh, query opt people can work on the query optimizer. Related to this, for the cost model, we don't have any good way to maintain statistics, uh, or, uh, information about what the data looks like, so then we can feed that into our cost model to make estimations of the quality of a query. Uh, so we would need a way to collect uh, statistics about the, that we can then feed into the system. We could also do sampling, which is another technique that Microsoft uses, where you just make a small little mini table and copy some data in, and then do, do your estimations based on that. Um, it does, this could then also be used for a new cost model that we can hook into the query optimizer. That would be amazing as well. If you're more interested in sort of like, like how do you execute queries, uh, we want to support common table expressions. So right now, again, we support TPCH. TPCH is from the 90s. It doesn't have CTEs. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, TPCDS is a more complex. Uh, uh, it's, the DSNs for decision support. It's a more complex OLAP workload or analytical workload than TPCH. And this has a bunch of CTEs, but we don't support any of that. So this would be modifying our parser or extending the parser to support the with and union clauses, um, modifying the optimizer to reason about uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the with clause and potentially rewriting that into joins in some cases. And then I don't know whether this is true or not, but you may have to also modify the execution engine to actually support CTEs, depending on how, what the queries actually look like. And I will fully admit, I don't know, full, I don't know all the ways you can unroll or decorrelate or rewrite CTEs. There's, a, there's a, actually a, a really good textbook from not the, the hyper guy in Germany, but his other German advisor. So another German wrote a book about query optimizers that we have access to that describe all the various techniques for this. So this is something we could do as well. We also need support for add drop indexes. So right now we can call create index when you create the table. And then as you insert tuples into a table, we'll, we'll populate it. But if the table already exists with, with a bunch of data in it and you call create index, it can't go back and populate it. Easiest way to do that is you pause the execution of all transactions, <laughs> excuse me, then populate it, and then turn transactions back on. But obviously that, that's bad because you're blocking everything. So being able to, do, uh, to, to build the index while you still update, update the tables is super interesting. A bunch of systems are just adding, like Postgres just added this in the last couple of years. Um, so th this would be really awesome to do. Be awesome to do this also with parallel threads. Think of this as doing a sequential scan uh, with multiple threads, and then they're all inserting into the index. Related to this would be multi-threaded multi queries. Uh, the, current open, the current version we have that you guys are working on uh, in the system only supports uh, single-threaded queries, but there is, my PhD student Prashant has a branch that supports parallel queries, but I, he, only has, he only has sort of the execution engine side of things. It would, the idea would be porting over his parallel query implementation, but then, then modifying the rest of the infrastructure of the system to recognize, oh, I can run queries in parallel, make, make sure that you know, plan, you know, plans come out the right way so they can be parallelized. 
We could also start adding support for like the pneumoware data placement techniques that the, 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 the hyper guys are doing with morsels uh, once we get to the basic, uh, the basic uh, in parallel engine working. Prepared statements are actually su also super important. Uh, we currently don't support this. So again, prepared statement is, I prepare a statement that says, I'm gonna execute this query over and over again. Here's some placeholders for, for some parameters. So you need to like cache that and then you can invoke it and, 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 and reuse the plan over and over again. So there's a bunch of different design decisions you have to consider to, uh, when you wanna do prepared statements, like when do you actually run it through the optimizer or when do you actually decide to replan things. All the various data systems do different things and this would be sort of an evaluation of the different techniques. So you'd have to modify the, 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 the wire protocol to handle this um, and then make sure, and what actually would be super awesome too is if instead of having a prepare statement cache and then a compile query cache, if we can unify them all together, that would be a big win. So my PhD student, Matt, is actually looking into this now. So if you're interested in, in pursuing this, you know, let me know. We can start talking uh, next week or this week. We concurrently support the write-ahead log, which I think we can replay the log upon restart. Um, this is not true. I think we can reinstall the catalogs. But as I said, you want to also be able to take checkpoints so you don't have to replay the entire log. So this would be adding support to do uh, checkpoints. So the, I think the simplest way to do this would be the snapshot isolation consistent checkpoint. Um, and you just piggyback off of the sequential scan implementation that's available in the data system now. And again, this, now you can sort of see an example where if you can work in tandem with another team, if another team is doing parallel queries and they support a parallel sequential scans, you could then support that in your checkpoint algorithm and now do sequential scans in parallel to, to, to write the checkpoint out. And then we want to be able to load the checkpoint in uh, after we start and then replay the log. Right, so it's not just I take a checkpoint and I'm done. It, integrating the full system is, is tricky. We want to support constraints uh, like uh, the, the check, uniqueness, foreign keys. And so this is, this is modifying the catalog, modifying the, 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 modifying like the, the front of the system to be able to handle this information, modifying the storage layer of the execution engine to enforce these constraints. So if I have a check clause that says like where value is not, you know, not negative, I have to know that when I'm inserting something, I comply that predicate and see whether that value is true or not. Um, same thing with foreign keys. Two additional things you can do is do online constraint changes with alter. Uh, meaning if I add a constraint that says this key can't be null, I have to scan through to make sure nothing is null because therefore I would, you know, if I try to apply a constraint that would already be violated at the beginning, that's bad. Um, another cool thing to actually be able to do is extend the query optimizer to be aware of some of these constraints. Like I know that something can't be negative, so therefore I may want to change how I do my join or do a scan, All right? That's the, the high-end systems that actually do this. That would actually be super cool. Sequences are the auto increment keys. So this would be adding support that we can store uh, sequences in the catalog and su support the next val function or the serial type so that we can do easily do auto increment keys. Um, this one is a bit more tricky because you want to do caching uh, in the catalog so that everybody, everybody, everybody calling next val doesn't always update the catalog. You could have something sitting around in memory that you, you hand out in batches. Um, the tricky thing though is you have to then all write out in the write ahead log how that, that value got incremented. So if I crash come back, the counter doesn't start at zero again. Or I don't, I don't have duplicate values. Different types are, would be interesting to do as well. So we talked about how the numeric type from the Germans, they claim is faster than the floating point numbers. Um, and then they claim that there's this book called Hacker's Delight, uh, which if you use Google, you can find, um, that describes the, the, sort of the, the underlying method for doing low level bit operations on fixed point decimals. It doesn't describe exactly how to do it in the context of a database. Like there's a bunch of stuff we have to do but the bit manipulation uh, techniques can be found in this book. So I'm, I'm actually super interested in this as well. I don't know how to do it, but we can sit down and, and learn it together. If you're interested in types and wanna do something more easy, enum type would be another one you could do. And this is just like enum you have in C++ or Java, same thing. And the idea what you have to do is that you would support the, at, at the catalog, keep track of all the enums as the array, modifying the binder to be able to enforce those enum constraints. So if someone gives us a value that doesn't exist for an enum, we throw an error. And then we have to be able to support this in the execution engine to, to, to know that I'm operating on an enum and then materialize the correct value when it produces the result to, to the application. I'm going through these quickly, but uh, you know, all the slides are online. I'm happy to talk about this uh, afterwards. So uh, we haven't really talked about views, but think of them as like a virtual table. I can define a view on a select query and I give it a name and it looks like a table. Then now I can run a query on that view uh, and treat it as if it was a table. 
And typically the way this, the data system handles this is that it'll rewrite your query into the, the to be doing a lookup on, on, the, on the actual underlying you know, view query. So uh, we'd have to support the, extend the catalog to support these things. We have to modify the binder to transform the view into the original query. Um, and as far as I know, I don't think we have to modify the execution engine. You can rewrite the views as a nested query, and I think it just work. And then the optimizer can just you know, decorrelate or optimize as, as necessary. All right, last two. Concurrent schema changes would be uh, if I add or drop a column, can I do that without having to lock everything? This is actually super tricky. This is the, the second year we've tried this. We, have, we think now we have the infrastructure to be able to do this in a very interesting way. Um, because now we can do like, this lazy method where you say add a column, we tell you we added it, but we don't actually go through it and, and uh, uh, you know, shuffle data around to add that, that memory location. It's only when you insert new things or you try to read back old stuff, then we can materialize it on the fly. The last one is data compression. Uh, so we support Apache Arrow, uh, and we have support for the, their dictionary compression scheme, which is very straightforward, but it's not turned on meaning we can't take hot data and convert it into a compressed cold data block. We used to have that infrastructure, but, but we don't anymore. So this would be adding support for convert, doing this conversion. Um, the reason why we don't have it, because you have to also update indexes, because you're moving tuples from one location to another. But then the tricky thing is going to be is now modify the execution engine in, so, in some way to be able to process the compressed data directly. Because right now, we, we, we can't do that. We, we would have to have the data, data table decompress it before we can do scans on it, which defeats the whole purpose of compression. All right, so how to get started. Form a team, which you've already sort of done with uh, Project 2. Uh, you should meet with your team, discuss your potential topics, potentially look over the source code, or contact me to sort of point you at what parts of the source code you want to look at. Um, I'm around all next week, or send me an email. I'm happy to discuss uh, you know, what are some potential topics you could look at. OK? All right, sorry for going over time. Uh, Next class, I'll post this on Piazza with more details, but you should have your proposal presentations. Five minutes, and it's a hard limit. OK? All right, guys, awesome. Thank you. See you. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit, because I ain't with that beer called the OE, because I'm OG Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked, and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on, because I needed just a little more kick. Like a fish after just one sip Yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off Eight ball done dropped off Cause ain't eyes hopped off Whoa.